Hello lovely people and welcome to another episode of Queer History 101 in long form. So if you haven't seen, I'm now making shorts here on YouTube. So these are videos of less than a minute that are hosted right here on YouTube and in the mobile app version they have their own little area. I'm currently doing a mix of vintage fashion with every month doing one week straight of outfits of the day at the start of the month and then Queer History 101 which is a series I was doing on TikTok that I'm now bringing over to shorts and I'm going to be continuing exclusively on here where I cover LGBTQ plus history in bite-sized chunks so please do leave in the comments anything you'd like to see and queer history and particularly the historical profile videos where I look at just one person are some of my favorites to make and I get a lot of comments asking to see more so of course the third video of the year had to be a historical profile thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video making it possible for me to do even more research with the secure VPN more on them later but who are we talking about today well when we think Think back to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s in the United States. Martin Luther King Jr. is probably the name that comes to mind, but there are some other pretty amazing people you might not know about. For instance, did you know that King's right-hand man and closest advisor, Bayard Rustin, not only planned the Million Man March and spent his life fighting for the rights of others, but was also openly gay? There are multiple pictures together that his name seems to have been left off. It feels like people have tried to erase him from history. Well, no more. So let's learn about the man who was proud to be who he was at a time when that was truly extraordinary. Bayard was born in 1912 and raised by his maternal grandparents, who he believed to be his parents, in Westchester, Pennsylvania. The family were relatively wealthy as they ran a catering business and could afford to keep all 12 children, of which Bayard believed he was the ninth by birth order in comfort. His grandmother Julia was a Quaker, and although she attended her husband's African Methodist Episcopalian church with the children, she brought the children up with her own Quaker values of equality, peace and justice, which explains her reaction to his childhood realisation of sexuality when he mentioned that he preferred to spend time with men rather than women, she responded, hmm, I suppose that's what you need to do. Excellent. A++ coming out reaction from a woman born in the 1800s. Grandma Julia was also a member of the NAACP and leaders of the group were frequently guests at the Ruston home. With his influences in his life, Baird was already campaigning against racially discriminatory Jim Crow laws in his youth. That's the name for state and local laws that enforced racial segregation in the southern United States in the late 19th century and early 20th century, although by early I do mean over halfway through. Thus, his beliefs were a combination of his religious and cultural background, Quaker values of peace, the non-violent methods taught by Mahatma Gandhi, and the socialism endorsed by African-American labor leader A. Philip Randolph. In 1932, Bayard entered Wilberforce University, a historically backed college in Ohio, and was active in a number of campus organizations, including the Omega Psi Psi fraternity. However, he was expelled four years later after organizing a strike. After completing an activist training program run by the American Friends Service Committee, which is a Quaker-founded organization working for peace and social justice in the United States and around the world, yeah, Friends are Quakers. I have a video on Quakerism. It's right here. I'm a Quaker, forgot to say that. Rustin moved to Harlem, New York in 1937 and began studying at City College of New York. He became involved in efforts to defend and free the Scottsboro Boys, nine young black teenagers in Alabama who were accused of being two white women. Which, by the way, is one of those huge and painful miscarriages of justice that make you look at people in positions of power and go, come on, you're all in on this, right? None of you actually believed this was an okay thing you were doing, did you? Did you? You know they're all children, right? Like, you're aware you're the villains in this film. He then joined the Young Communist League, as he was initially drawn to the League's progressive views on racial issues. At the direction of the Soviet Union, the Communist Party of USA, CPUSA, and its members were active in the civil rights movement, as the CPUSA at the time followed Stalin's theory of nationalism, favoring the creation of a separate nation for African Americans, which was to be located in the American Southeast, where the greatest proportion of the black population was concentrated. However, in 1941, after Germany invaded the Soviet Union, the group's focus changed to supporting the Soviet Union and encouraging the United States to join World War II and abandoning their civil rights work, leading Bayard to leave the League, understandably. And also remember that he was extremely against going to war. He's a pacifist, going so far as refusing to register for the draft and being sent to jail in 1944 as a conscientious objector. 
He worked with A. Philip Randolph, the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and A. J. Must, leader of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, or FOR, a socialist pacifist group, where Baird worked as race relations secretary in the late summer of 1941 to propose a march on Washington, D.C. in 1941 to protest racial segregation in the armed forces and widespread discrimination in employment. On meeting with President Roosevelt in the Oval Office, Randolph respectfully and politely, very firmly, told President Roosevelt that African Americans would march on the Capitol unless desegregation occurred. To prove their good faith, the organisers cancelled the planned march after Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, the Fair Employment Act, banned discrimination in defence industries and federal agencies. Yeah, they didn't really believe the president. But the organiser of the march, Randolph, cancelled it anyway because he did. The armed forces were um, not actually desegregated until 1948 under an executive order issued by President Harry S. Truman, so... Bayard then travelled to California to organise other volunteers in protection of the property of the more than 120,000 Japanese Americans, most of whom were US-born citizens who had been imprisoned in internment camps. Which is the whole other thing. Impressed with Rushton's organisational skills, A.J. Must appointed him as FOR's Secretary for Student and General Affairs. Throughout the 1950s, Rushton quickly became part of King's inner circle as the civil rights movement grew. Despite others thinking he was a liability. But you know what is? A liability, though? Your unprotected Wi-Fi. Oh yeah, smooth. Transition to Surfshark advert. As mentioned earlier, this video is sponsored by Surfshark. So a massive thank you to them for making this video possible. We all know Surfshark by now. It's a favourite of mine for being a great VPN service, enabling you to change your location, watch movies from any country in the world. But Surfshark is a great service, allowing you to protect your data and identity from thieves, protect your privacy online, publish without a geotag, keep your web browsing private, prevent internet throttling and save money booking plane tickets and hotel rooms. It's great to have a little help from the internet, especially fact-checking historical profiles, and Surfshark was a huge help in my research for this video. I was able to change my location to America and read articles that I wouldn't otherwise have had access to here in the UK. Thanks to Surfshark, I was able to read the full 1987 interview with Rustin. I learnt so much more about him, including his recollection of MLK's feelings towards gay people. Much like Rustin to King in the 1950s, Surfshark feels like the advisor in my life. Whenever I need them, they're there. As the protector of my online internet life, I'm safe working as a content creator with Surfshark around. And they can protect you too, whilst also giving you access to content that your location would normally block you from seeing. You can bypass the content throttling, government censorship, and the uncomfortable feeling you're being tracked. Click the link in the description and use code JESSICA for 83% off Surfshark, plus three months extra for free. They offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you know, go go my friends. In that 1987 interview Rustin took with The Village Voice, he stated, It's difficult for me to know exactly what Dr. King felt about my gayness, except to say that I'm sure he would have been sympathetic and would not have had the prejudicial view. Otherwise, he would not have hired me. I think the gay community has a moral obligation to do whatever's possible to encourage more and more gays to come out of the closet. 25, 30 years ago, the barometer of human rights in the United States was black people. That's no longer true. The barometer for judging the character of people in regard to human rights is now those who consider themselves gay, homosexual, or lesbian. Rustin was also a pioneer in the movement to desegregate interstate bus travel. As a reminder, obviously different states have different laws. So in some states, the buses would be segregated and in other states, they wouldn't. In 1942, he boarded a bus in Louisville, bound for Nashville, and sat in the second row. He was asked to move to the back, according to the Southern practice of Jim Crow, but refused. The bus was stopped by police 13 miles north of Nashville, and he was arrested. Baird was beaten and taken to a police station, but was then released uncharged. He spoke about his decision to be arrested, and how that moment also clarified his life as a gay person in an interview with the Washington Blade. As I was going by the second seat to the rear, a white child reached out for the ring necktie I was wearing and pulled it, whereupon its mother said, don't touch it, n-word. If I go and sit quietly at the back of that bus now, that child, who was so innocent of race relations that it was just going to play with me, will have seen so many blacks go in the back and sit down quietly that it's going to end up saying, oh, they like it back there. Oh, I've never seen anybody protest against it. 
I owe it to that child, not only to my own dignity, I owe it to that child, that it should be educated to know that blacks do not want to sit at the back, and therefore I should get arrested, letting all these white people in the bus know that I do not accept that. It occurred to me shortly after that, that it was an absolute necessity for me to declare homosexuality, because if I didn't, I was a part of that prejudice, and I was aiding and abetting the prejudice that was a part of the effort to destroy me. And thus, he did. And after more than 10 years working at FOR, in 1953, Bayard was fired from his position as Secretary for Student and General Affairs. He was also arrested in Pasadena, charged with sex perversion, for having sex with another man. This was sadly one of the many times that Ruston's sexuality would be used against him. However, in 1956, his mentor Randolph convinced Bayard to meet with Martin Luther King Jr. to show support for the Montgomery bus boycott. Martin Luther King, only young at the time, was forever changed after his encounter with Bayard. Bayard wrote that when they met, King was aware of his sexual orientation, yet Bayard demonstrated excellent strategies and skills, particularly in organisation. And although King was a strong leader and a great public speaker, these were skills he lacked, meaning that Bayard being an openly gay man was overlooked, at least for the time being. Which is obviously a really interesting insight considering it's the height of the AIDS crisis, something that the US government also did not respond to incredibly well. But that's a video for another time. 1960 itself saw tensions come to a head at the Democratic National Convention for presidential candidate John F. Kennedy in LA. Randolph, King and Bayard Rustin made arrangements to march at the convention. In response, Democratic leadership sent black congressman Adam Clayton Powell to stop the march before it happened, and he used Bayard's sexual orientation as his weapon. Powell threatened King, telling him if they proceeded with the march, he would accuse King of having an affair with Bayard. This would not only kill the march, but also a possibly fatal blow to the whole movement. I can certainly understand this is something MLK would need to avoid and to put the movement first. After consulting with close confidence, King decided to distance himself from Bayard, although Bayard was understandably reluctant to resign. Prior to the Washington March from 1960 to 1963, Bayard continued working with Randolph on civil rights issues just slightly behind the camera. During these years, Bayard wasn't involved in organising marches and the movement saw little progress. It then became clear to MLK that the movement so many people sacrificed their lives for was losing its momentum. King slowly but surely welcomed Rustin back during the Birmingham campaign of 1963. Unfortunately for Bayard, certain people within the movement still very much opposed his involvement because of their perceptions of him. Roy Wilkins, executive secretary of the NAACP, stated, I know you're a Quaker, but that's not what I'll have to defend. I'll have to defend draft dodging. I'll have to defend promiscuity. The question is never going to be homosexuality. It's going to be promiscuity, and I can't defend that. Due to this criticism, which they would inevitably receive, King came up with a plan to keep Bayard involved, but in a less obvious way. King wanted Randolph to lead the march as a respected figure in the movement. He wouldn't attract the same questioning as Bayard. Long stated, but King and Lewis also knew that if Randolph became the official director of the march, he would appoint Bayard as his deputy. And Bayard would really be the one who would lead the march. Bayard's personal life and past were again unfairly used against the movement. Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina brought negative media attention to Bayard, claiming the march was organised by a communist draft dodger and homosexual. I mean, I'd put that on a badge and wear it, but sure. Thankfully, what once would have destroyed the movement had at this point lost its effectiveness. When questioned by the media, MLK and other leaders of the organisation spoke out in support of Bayard. Even Wilkins put his reservations aside for the sake of the movement. You may not know this, but Bayard Rustin actually then organised the March on Washington and still stood beside King as he gave the iconic I Have a Dream speech. This is yet another example of how the force behind the march was massively overlooked, most likely due to Bayard's sexuality. The Washington March went on to be more successful than anyone could have imagined and marked a turning point for both the country and for Rustin. Following this success, Bayard and King continued to work together for years, although their views still clashed from time to time, of course. The famous Selma and Montgomery March occurred as part of the Civil Rights Movement in 1965 in Alabama. Protesters, including Rustin and King, marched the 45-mile route from Selma to Montgomery with hopes to register black voters in the South. They were confronted with violence from local authorities and white vigilante groups, which became 
deadly. They walked for three days straight, under protection from the National Guard's troops. The protesters finally achieved their goal. This march lived on in history for its great efforts and the changes achieved. They raised awareness of the difficulties faced by black voters and the need for a National Voting Rights Act. This event has been depicted in the media many times. The Selma to Montgomery march has rightfully been featured on TV, in films, books and the news. However, as you can imagine, these retellings are not always 100% historically accurate. Although Bayard Rustin was heavily involved in this march, it's not been mentioned in any media retelling. In the Academy Award nominated 2014 film Selma, it features Martin Luther King taking on other figures of authority in the small Alabama town as part of the fight for equal voting rights. President Lyndon B. Johnson, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, Andrew Young, leaders of the SDLC, they were all figures of authority from Alabama featured in the film, all given stream time, um, except for one man. They had Rustin. Where's he at? Rustin doesn't get identified to the viewer in Selma, despite his influence on MLK and the march itself. Rustin's work behind the scenes barely receives screen time. He's the one key player whose name is never spoken during the film's 127 minutes. His role in the planning and participation in important events in the civil rights movement and his influence on King have often been blatantly omitted from cinema. On imdb.com, a search for Bayard Rustin produces very limited results. However, a search for MLK provides more than 20 biographical films and TV characters organizations of the leader, not many of them including his closest advisor. Walter Neagle was Rustin's partner for the last 10 years of his life. Neagle believed the lack of Rustin-centered films, or even just films that included him, was due to Hollywood's slow acceptance of homosexuality. He was gay and the popular culture is just warming up to the idea of gay lead characters and unfortunately they're usually somewhat stereotypical. Neagle co-wrote the biography, Bayard Rustin, the invisible activist. The idea of a strong, gay, black man who is athletic in his youth and an activist, intellectual and political strategist as an adult may be difficult to condense into a single man. Yet that's who Bayard was and that was what made him exceptional. I'm sure that many of you can recall from history lessons that MLK was tragically assassinated in 1968. Prior to his death, sadly King and Bayard Rustin had had another disagreement. Bayard had questioned the Poor People's Campaign and if the demonstration would even have an effect on things. Whilst Bayard supported fighting for people in poverty in the country, he doubted the timing, fearing it could lead to violence in an already struggling community. After voicing his opinions publicly, King felt betrayed and dismissed Bayard from the planning team. However, after King's assassination, Bayard flew to Memphis, offering to step back in and help lead the campaign. Sadly, leadership within the movement was still opposed to Bayard's involvement, so without King there to support him, Bayard withdrew his agreement. Bayard continued his role in activism, however, throughout his lifetime. In the 1980s, he became more open and honest about his sexuality, speaking at events for gay rights, and even put the AIDS crisis on the NAACP's radar. In the last years of his life, Bayard gave that aforementioned interview with the Washington Blade, recalling the hardships of being both black and gay in the civil rights movement. He spoke about how that shaped his beliefs, especially his refusal to ever hide his sexuality. Bayard Rustin died on August 24, 1987, just four days shy of the march's 24th anniversary. Rustin's fight for nonviolence lived on amongst many people inspired by his perseverance for rights. In 2013, President Barack Obama awarded Bayard Rustin the Presidential Medal for Freedom for his incredible career in civil rights activism. That wasn't recognized enough during Bayard's lifetime or even now, but we can be grateful that there was another step in the right direction and that the president was able to honor Bayard's efforts all those years ago. As I've spoken about today, there simply wasn't enough media coverage of people like Bayard Rustin as an openly gay black man. However, we may expect and hope that things have changed by now in 2022. I hope you found this video interesting and that you've learned something about Bayard Rustin and that we keep talking about him and others who history might have forgotten to give the recognition they deserve. If you enjoyed this video, you can check out my historical profiles playlist where I look into other very interesting people that history may not have told you about or may not have told you about in the right way. <gasps> Were they gay too? Maybe. Yeah. They were. Or disabled. I know. Fascinating. You can either click the card up here or there's a link in the description that's down there. What else is down there? Oh, a link to Surfshark's unmissable offer? Ha! Huh, stunning. And I will see you in my next video, which also has Claudia. Bye!